Today I'm going to talk about an opera I'm in the process of writing. I'm sat here in my bed. This is a pretty chilled out vlog style thing. Okay, I've already gone through the lengthy process of applying to write the opera, but to start from the beginning so that I can explain this process clearly and document the process of writing an opera, let's just start with who or what is Enola? <laughs> Basically, it's a network of opera academies based all over Europe. So when we had to pitch our opera, we had to pitch it to so many people. It was online, which made it a lot easier, but it didn't make it any less nerve-wracking. So they have a network of opera houses based all over Europe, and one of its goals is to make opera more diverse. They want to support projects with new narratives and explore new forms and aesthetics that embody the diversity of today's world and they want it to be brought about by creative teams from all artistic backgrounds. So when we were applying, we had to bear this in mind. And I have to say we have a very diverse group in our team. And when we applied for this project, we didn't know which opera house would say, yep, yeah, we'll help make your opera <laughs> if anyone wants to do it all. Let's talk a bit about the application process, or the selection process. So in order to get into the Opera Creation Journey Scheme, in other words, in order to get to use the resources from Enola to write an opera, we first had to prepare an application as a team. So this is before we got to the part where we could pitch our opera to various opera houses, we had to apply and then get shortlisted. So the application involved us making a three minute video, explaining our project and writing a I think it was, it was a one-page statement we had to write as well. And I think we worked really well as a team. We met up on Zoom and discussed ideas and put together a, a project. Up to 10 projects or creative teams will be selected to go through to the second round. So we were selected to go through to the second round. That was amazing. And the last vlog I have on the opera is that second round, which was three days worth of workshops and practicing our presentation and then finally pitching our opera project to a massive online room of various opera organisations, opera houses, opera companies and hoping that one of them at least would want to take on our project and carry it further. We got selected. We have a operatic company in Lisbon that want to help us Write this opera, which is amazing. I'm very ecstatic and I can't wait to write it. It is the Calust Gulbenkian Foundation in Lisboa. It's a Portuguese institution dedicated to the promotion of the arts, philanthropy, science and education. They want to help us write our opera. <laughs> We're going to have an online meeting with the, the deputy director of the Fundação Calust Gulbenkian. I don't know, I can't speak Portuguese, but I have been learning. I am only at the beginning. Eu sou uma menina. I'm not, am I? Eu sou uma mulher. Mulher. Uma mulher. I don't know. I'm not that good at it. I've only learnt a few words. Anyway. So I'm going to use these vlog type videos to document the process of writing an opera, basically. Because it's going to be a big, long process. The project itself is called Queering Opera, and we're basically taking all aspects of an opera and applying something unconventional to them. So if you think about the term queer, what does it mean really? It seems to go against the conventionalised norm, doesn't it? Anything that's not conventional or conservative is considered queer. And yes, you have it in terms of the LGBTQ community, but also I think you can apply it to all aspects of an opera. There's a lot of trans opera singers in the world. There isn't a lot of trans repertoire, trans singing repertoire. I don't know any of any repertoire out there for trans singers. There are opera singers like, let me find someone, Lucia Lucas, an American transgender baritone, and she made history when in March 2018 it was announced that she would become the first female transgender baritone to perform a principal role on an American operatic stage. So she is a woman, however, being born a man has a baritone voice, but is keeping that baritone voice because... Well, if you listen to it, it's amazingly powerful. It's better than most baritone voices out there. And if you watch interviews with her, she, you hear her say that she doesn't actually mind playing any different, any character at all, male, female, whatever. As long as in real life, she doesn't have to act. So we have this premise. We were like, well, clearly voice is gendered in a conservative sense, conventionalized sense, whatever. But what if we try and mix up, as a crude example, 
men can dress as women, women can dress as men. As long as everyone dresses as something different, no one is dressed as themselves, it couldn't be seen as some sort of appropriation. Because there's another problem. It's inappropriate for someone who's not, say, trans to play trans if they're not, because you could be taking away that part from a trans singer or a trans actor, for instance. So if we take the singers, performers, actors, and we literally switch everyone's roles around so that everyone is playing something different so that it evens the playing field again, if that makes sense. And the whole point of that is to blur the boundaries even more. So yes, you're looking at an opera, you know it's got trans singers in it, but you don't know what gender anyone is. The whole point is to confuse the audience, blur the boundaries, such that they will stop having to rely on gender. Voice will not be an indicator of gender, because it's not really, that's the whole point. When you get trans singers, voice isn't an indicator of gender. Second, visually. The way you dress doesn't necessarily have to determine your gender either. Women might want to dress androgynously. Men might want to wear dresses. And I don't mean in a drag queen way either. But then again, there, is, there are drag queens. That can happen. We have a non-binary protagonist and they don't want to be defined by anything. They might dress as a man one day because they fancy it. They might dress androgynously the next day. They might dress in drag one day because that's how they feel but it doesn't mean anything it doesn't mean that they're a drag queen it doesn't mean they're a woman it doesn't mean that they are androgynous and in that bracket it's just whatever if i don't feel like live in the moment so that's the premise of the opera we have in a nutshell <laughs> my main idea is to do with the voices trans singers if you think about it say you have a well, you might even have a man who sings soprano we call it soprano or even from falsetto just because they sound amazing why not it seems to be an unconventional thing but it does happen the sound world of that though if you think about it the tessitura of a man who's born a man conventional man it's quite low usually around the baritone range it depends of course you get tenors and basses but i just mean speaking voice it's usually below middle c if you think about it you know just when you're writing music but because the tessitura is of that range when they sing high it's got this different unique sound quality to it that is different from, say, a female soprano singing that same pitch. I'll give you an example with musical instruments. Think of the bassoon. Its natural resonance is at a lower pitch. The bass clef, that's its tessitura, but when you have it playing high, it sounds very different. Now, if you take, say, a oboe, it would resonate more round and fully at a high pitch in the treble clef, because that's its tessitura. If you take the bassoon and play the same pitches in the treble clef, it's not its tessitura, it's more, it, it kind of strains to get up. Does that, it doesn't mean it doesn't sound beautiful, it just sounds different. And this is what I think of when I hear like someone born a man with a deep voice singing falsetto. It sounds good and interesting even though it's not at the resonant frequency, it's not at the tessitura, it still sounds good and interesting. And I thought, well, trans singers are changing their voices and some of them are. There are examples of mm, people born men who become female and their voice changes and they sing soprano and the sound quality is slightly different from someone who was born female singing soprano. That notion is comparative to, say, a bassoon or a cello playing much higher than its tessitura or its standard range. There's this other timbre that's brought into the sound. You can do it vice versa as well. So you take a, a, an instrument that's typically played high, like a flute, and you just play it at like middle C, like its bottom range. It sounds quite breathy. It sounds quite nice, but it's harder to do. It's the same for female singers, it's harder for a female singer to sing like a man, but it's easier for a man to sing like a woman, a conventional woman, a conventional man. So I thought something interesting could be done with the sound world of the instruments. Visually, we were discussing things like straight lines combined with sort of amorphous, misty colours and lights that blend and have no boundaries really. Straight lines could be things like a dining room table or cubicle doors. And then we have this idea that the toilet cubicles, say in a, in a club, it's like a central space you get changed in there, people are dancing in there, people have sex in there, people got the toilet in there, people put on lipstick, take it off, gossip about what's going on, people cry in there, take drugs in there, a whole lot of stuff goes on in the toilets of a club. So I thought that's going to be an interesting narrative and plus you've got all the cubicle doors and you can have people getting changed behind and if you think about a club with all these people in it doing the thing in the toilets, whatever it is, whether it's going to the toilet, having sex, taking drugs, crying, laughing, cooling down from the loudness of the club. It's kind of like the one place where the masks come off, if they ever do. Everything you listen to, it alludes to a style. You're going to hear something and go, that sounds like something else I've heard. I like this because it reminds me of something. Because we can't not think 
in terms of our preconceived ideas about something. I know I sound like a broken record when I say that, but it's true. If I write music, say, and I just want it to explore the frequency freely, people are going to listen and go, oh, that bit sounded tonal, or that bit sounded atonal, and those two can be compared with each other, and then they stand out, and then you impose a boundary, don't you, between these two things, and then it doesn't sound right. And it's the same with the notion of being non-binary. Our protagonist is non-binary in this opera, and they walk through life getting defined, having a constant place in them, even the notion of non-binary becomes a concept and of course non-binary is someone who doesn't want to be defined it's a contradiction so if i wanted to explore harmony or frequency just pitch frequency freely i wouldn't be able to because people would hear things in it and impose boundaries on different sections of it and that's interesting that's something that can be utilized and manipulated in the writing of this opera and, and manipulated in such a way that we can use it to tell a story about how absurd it is to have all these definitions when people just don't want to be defined and they want to just dress and live and be however they want without people going drag queen gay binary non-binary androgynous and Another idea we had was to have two perspectives going on. So we have the, for instance, the opera on the stage. Perhaps it presents a conventionalised, very regimented, harmonically cliched opera. You expect to hear an opera, you hear an opera basically. But then maybe we have headphones where there's some other sound coming through that contradicts it, but also complements it and adds a different layer and a different perspective and makes us change the way we see and hear the opera. Now, the audience has their own choice. They can listen to this perspective if they want or they can just watch the opera on the stage. And it's going to reflect the narrative because of course there will be two perspectives in the narrative. You will have the, the protagonist living their life and then underneath their desire to be non-binary and of course the different perspectives are going to change throughout the opera so you might have the outer perspective of the conventionalised living whatever how it should be according to a conservative way of living I don't know that might happen inside the head at some point maybe their like, upbringing and ingrained morals are holding them back and you hear that in the head and so the perspectives can shift in a nutshell we have two perspectives a regimented conservative way of living and a freer non-boundaried way of living and of course that's impossible because we're going to impose boundaries. The, the listeners are going to impose boundaries. Everybody imposes labels and boundaries on things in order to understand it. But we have these two perspectives and the two are going to interact. I've got some more ideas about the music which I'll talk about later. But for now, we're going to have a meeting online with the deputy director of the Kovenkin Foundation, which should be exciting. I hope it stirs up more ideas and more things to talk about. Anyway, that's me rambling from my bed. There's a big spider in this room, by the way, so I'm really scared. Well, I'm on it.